Welcome to the sun-drenched tropical paradise of Isle Delfino. We're so pleased to welcome you to our beautiful home. Refresh your body and spirit. Super Mario Sunshine is a game I replay every summer, and I've kept that tradition going for about 15 years. The bright sun, the gorgeous blue oceans, the relaxing vistas, the colorful art design. I mean, what better way to celebrate the season? Okay, maybe it's a bit early for me to be playing this game, but it's summertime somewhere, right? Because I've kept this tradition going for so long, I know Super Mario Sunshine like the back of my hand. And as I've continued to relive it, I've observed some peculiar things about its design. Super Mario Sunshine is a weird game. It remains the only main series Super Mario game to feature full voice acting. Which is hit or miss, to put it lightly. It recycles content and uses blue coins to make up for its comparatively small amount of courses. It is home to some of the most infamously difficult power stars in the history of 3D Mario. Mario has a water jetpack that lets you hover over platforming challenges. And its structure actively betrays its own design. With that said, if I really felt negatively about the game as a whole, I wouldn't be replaying it annually. Personally, I have made peace with the fact that it's not an entirely ideal sequel to Super Mario 64 in structure. It may throw a powerful jetpack into the mix that lets you dominate trickier platforming scenarios, but that's totally fine with me. I've come to love this game just as much as its predecessor. But even so, there's a reason it remains a contentious game in the Mario franchise, and having played this game a lot, I am fully aware of those reasons. In this video, I wanted to take an honest look at Super Mario Sunshine. I wanted to showcase what brilliant game design I genuinely feel it contains. I wanted to shed light on the various problems people have with it, as well as pull back the curtain on why I suspect the game turned out the way it did. I am endlessly fascinated with how weird this game can be. And I wanted to walk you through the thoughts I've had about it for a long time. I'm Liam Triforce, and these are my thoughts on one of the weirdest Mario games. Super Mario Sunshine The game begins with Mario and company arriving for their vacation on the world's smallest runway, only to be immediately greeted with trouble. There's a silhouette running around defacing Isle Delfino that looks exactly like Mario. You get acquainted with the controls a bit before the Isle Delfino police arrest Mario on the pretense that he looks like the silhouette that's been painting graffiti everywhere even though eyewitnesses saw Mario arrive on that plane and clean up the goop on the runway, but no one went to bat for him. So Mario gets thrown in jail, and his trial consists of the prosecution pushing for a guilty verdict based on nothing but a sketch. So not only do they have no tangible evidence to go on, nor do they ever call a single witness to the stand, Mario doesn't even have a defense attorney. Doesn't Mario have the right to a lawyer? Doesn't he at least get a chance to defend himself? Peach and Toadsworth call an objection, I guess they were representing Mario? But the judge immediately overrules it and declares Mario guilty as charged. What, no jury either? The judge can just decide who goes to prison without any deliberation? And also, the judge immediately sentences Mario as if the punishment was predetermined. Isle Delfino is messed up. If this gave you a negative impression of the Piantas, I wouldn't blame you. But I also definitely feel like they were written like this on purpose. In Super Mario 64, as well as certain games like it, it's not uncommon for NPCs to withhold collectibles paramount to progression until you help them out. Even if their world is in peril, they will not give you your precious MacGuffin until you beat them in a race or something. In Super Mario Sunshine, this is the norm. All of the Shine Sprites have left the Shine Gate, leaving Delfino Plaza to tremble under a veil of darkness. With that said, the Piantas will withhold Shine Sprites from Mario until he helps them out with whatever issue it is they might be facing. That has to be illegal, but then again, I'm pretty sure Isle Delfino's entire justice system is corrupt. So, who knows? Basically, the odds are stacked against Mario because of a crime he didn't commit, and the Piantas are hell-bent on giving him a hard time. Even if you help them out, they'll still manipulate poor Mario and treat him terribly. 
Even after saving Hotel Delfino from the silhouette of a manta ray, the hotel's owner will still trick Mario into helping him again. After washing the goop off of some of these piantas, sometimes they'll just send Mario flying. I'll remind you that while the piantas are treating you like this, Mario can be clearly observed chasing down the real perpetrator and the court never thinks to have his sentence reversed. Isle Delfino is cruel and unjust to its visitors, and I find it absolutely hilarious that the game seems to go all in on that concept. It unquestionably extends to some of the shine sprites you collect, and I'm sure you can think of a few that totally encompass that feeling. Of course, a lot of factors went into this paradise not being what it seems, and we'll unpack that in time. For now, let's focus on why I continue to revisit this game. First of all, the setting. Every single course on Isle Delfino is connected to the island itself, as you can see various landmarks across the island from different points in each course. Even if the geometry is a bit questionable at times, like Pianta Village existing in a giant hole in the dead center of the island, you can still see its giant palm tree from behind Gelato Beach if you look from Pina Park, or from up high on Rico Harbor. Since the levels of Super Mario 64 were all disconnected from each other and accessed through paintings, it's awesome to see courses all distinctly themed around the locales of a tropical island. You have Bianco Hills, this quaint village with a big windmill tying everything together. You can climb on the rooftops and chain moves together in order to reach collectibles. And the level's compact size ensures a comforting introduction to the platforming and exploration you'll be doing throughout the game. Next is Rico Harbor, which is home to a bustling fishing market and blooper surfing on the water below its seemingly endless construction. One of the things I love most about Rico Harbor is the multitude of ways in which you can reach that elevated little village with the fountain, because it encourages you to think about the best ways to link your moves together, as well as showing you how other parts of the level connect together. You can jump around on the boat and link up with it via the hover nozzle or use the moving platform to make it up, but you can also climb atop the girders and fences and collect coins. Or you can swim over to the helipad and unlock the rocket nozzle for easy exploration. The risk factor is increased with the more vertical level design, and the threat of having to climb back up if you fall off the girders. Gelato Beach exists solely on the shores here, with the exception of a hill to climb and tight ropes to walk for more goodies. Despite playing into the veiled nightmare of Isle Delfino by introducing Cataquax, I find Gelato Beach to be one of the most relaxing levels in the game by design, and the steel drum heightens that tropical relaxation. The melody it uses is a motif that Delfino Plaza, Bianco Hills, Rico Harbor, and Gelato Beach all share, and they all have their unique takes on that melody. Delfino Plaza uses a pizzicato and accordion in the style of Italian folk music. Bianco Hills plays with it using a clarinet and flute, as well as some bouncy percussion that steals the spotlight. Rico Harbor uses an upbeat ska style with a saxophone and an electric guitar. It's rare for electric guitars to be heard in Mario music, but it feels surprisingly elegant in the context of this level. The melody doesn't appear throughout the rest of the levels as composers Koji Kondo and Shinobu Tanaka probably wanted more diverse sounds to represent each area, but it's a detail I appreciate, and further strengthens the connection between each area of Isle Delfino. Pina Park might be a smaller level, but it has its own design and atmospheric flourishes that make platforming exciting, like the hidden platforming challenge behind the ferris wheel that lets you reach the top once solved, the pirate ships and how they can allow you to reach new heights and find blue coins, and the fences in their height allowing for different angles on ascending the ferris wheel. I especially enjoy the happy-go-lucky music and general vibe of this place. It figures that an amusement park would be one of the highlights of a destination like Isle Delfino, and Pina Park is a memorable course for sure. Of course, then there's the peaceful sunset of Serena Beach, the calm serenity of Noki Bay and its giant waterfall, as well as Pianta Village allowing you to soak in the history of Isle Delfino at both dawn and dusk, as well as vibe with the villagers as they play their music. The amount of distinctive life and personality in each course, despite revolving around the central theme of Tropical Island, is staggering. There's also a surprising amount of dialogue in this game, with several NPCs having ongoing stories. It's used to represent the overarching narrative of each level, such as the struggles of the owner of Hotel Delfino, as well as the mayor of Pianta Village. 
Of course, there are also optional interactions that you can seek out yourself. If you run toward the windmill after defeating the goopy boss in Bianco Hill's first episode, you can talk to the Pianta up there, who comments on how you're getting ahead of yourself. I also always like the Pianta that sits on this lonely, infamous little island, yearning to return to Delfino Plaza if only he could swim. Toward the end of the game, the entire plaza is flooded as your nemesis coaxes you into Corona Mountain. The flood washes that Pianta ashore, and at first he's excited, but as soon as the flood subsides, he develops Stockholm Syndrome and just wants to get back to that island. All of this combined makes Isle Delfino feel like a truly lived-in setting, which to this day remains unique in the context of a Super Mario game. While most are more concerned with each level being completely different from the last, Sunshine just wants you to soak in its setting and details, and immerse yourself in its sights, sounds, and culture. I love Isle Delfino. While Sunshine only has seven courses excluding Delfino Plaza, Corona Mountain, and the Airstrip, these levels are not only thematically rich, but they're also brilliant sandboxes that make exceptional use of Mario's abilities, and they are an absolute treat to explore. I've touched upon the fun that can be had in some of them already, but I've only scratched the surface. Serena Beach Episode 3 has you figuring out how each locked room in Hotel Delfino connects, so that you can get the one fruit you need for Yoshi. This has you jumping up through floor tiles and solving puzzles to end up in various rooms, and it's funny to see how everyone reacts to Mario storming in on their hotel room just to find a pineapple. Once you hop on Yoshi, you'll be able to eat the boo blocking your path to find a hidden blue coin, as well as explore the maze-like attic of the hotel to find the correct cracked tile that lets you access the pool. This level is absolutely phenomenal, and it acquaints you with the layout of Hotel Delfino so that you can dig deeper and find more blue coins if you so desire. It also presents a unique challenge because it restricts Mario's room for movement a lot of the time. You have to think within the boundaries of these small rooms and hallways to reach new areas, as well as apply your knowledge of the game in methods akin to another Nintendo series I love so dearly. Later in Episode 8, you'll have to somehow collect 8 red coins across the entire hotel in 3 minutes. In a maze-like structure such as Hotel Delfino, this is a huge challenge, but the game prepares you for the task. Plus, the better you get at exploring Hotel Delfino, the more blue coins you can find. Even more so than Super Mario 64, objectives can transform the way levels are explored. While you could make an argument that Super Mario 64 didn't make use of its differing level states very often, and you could feasibly collect each star without the game kicking you out, I can't really say the same for Sunshine. Nearly every single objective puts a new spin on the level. Pianta Village has an episode where everything is covered in fiery goop, and it strips Mario of his trusty companion Flood. Up until this point, you'll have faced self-contained areas that remove Flood from your arsenal. These miniature courses are designed both to strengthen your familiarity with Mario's moveset, as well as test you on your core platforming. When stripped of a jetpack that allows you to hover wherever you like, you'll begin to realize just how much you've been relying on that very move to get around. This, in turn, gets you better at jumping around, and later shines require versatility from the player, such as Peanut Park's red coins and Ferris wheel shines, and pretty much everything about Noki Bay. This all comes to a head in Pianta Village's Goopy Inferno, which asks you to somehow reach the golden mushroom in the center without your beloved jetpack. If you land in the goop, you're pretty much dead. There's almost no way to get out of it once you're in. You need to somehow create a path for yourself through this goop, and there are multiple ways of doing this depending on what moves you decide to use and which parts of the level you interact with. What I've always done is I inch along this bar right here and hop onto the palm tree to the left. I climb up to the top, snag a blue coin if I haven't collected it yet, and then spin jump down onto this mushroom, which gives me a clear shot at reuniting with Flood and saving the day. This was just the solution I found as a kid that always stuck with me, and I'm sure some of you have found your own ways of obtaining the shine. I'm pretty sure the intended method is to use the village underside, but that speaks to the beauty of this objective. Speaking of which, Pianta Village might seem like a huge level at first, but it's densely packed with things to do and it all takes place on a square-shaped platform, with both the village itself and the underside taking advantage of this. It has these tall palm trees that host their own secrets and shortcuts to other parts of the level, a tall palm tree in the center that can be scaled with the rocket nozzle for more secrets, and a sizable jungle gym underneath which can yield both red coins for objectives and blue coins for the more curious players. And after you've given those chain chomps a bath, solved the secret of the village underside and everything else, 
you'll finally be tasked with searching for the eight red coins during the village's fluff festival. It's a giant hunt for the eight red coins across every inch of the level. You'll have to revisit parts of the level you've come to know in order to find everything, and it all ends with this nerve-wracking climb to the peak of the village's largest palm tree, and a ride toward the shine over certain death. Noki Bay is another fantastic level. You have shines that require you to scale the mountainside cliffs as well as use clever, fast platforming to explore the inside of the mountain before it closes with you inside. Doing so can yield not just regular yellow coins, but also blue coins if you decide to explore the various nooks and crannies. Using Flood can also allow you to link up with those areas if you know where to jump from, which is what makes this level so much fun to explore and solve. Speaking of Flood, let's talk about him for a second. Washing away goop and hovering around are two of this game's primary mechanics. The act of washing away goop is remarkably satisfying thanks to the detailed reactions from the goop, and how natural the GameCube controller's analog triggers are for this kind of thing. The force you apply to the R button is relative to the force of the water that comes out of Flood, and you can click the R button all the way in to stand still and spray, which is great for accurately aiming at things that need a consistent amount of force. The act of washing away goop is a consistent mechanic applied in various ways throughout the game, and it occasionally intersects with platforming for an added challenge. Maybe Gooper Blooper will have you spraying while dodging. Maybe you'll be cleaning up goop while platforming around the cliffs of Noki Bay. Maybe you'll be using the force of your water to push lily pads and boats. Or maybe you'll be trying to survive a nightmarish attack from manta rays that split up and multiply. From the smallest interactions to the largest problems, it's always present, and it's always pleasing. It feels so organically integrated into the game's design. You can also switch to the Hover Nozzle, which as you could guess allows you to hover for a brief period of time, and it washes away anything directly below you. You might think that being able to hover in this game might give the player too much leeway, but I honestly feel very positively about the Hover Nozzle. Multiple platforming scenarios can be linked together with the Hover Nozzle, especially in levels like Rico Harbor, Pina Park, Pianta Village, and as mentioned, Noki Bay. The levels are designed around being able to hover, and I always have a blast trying to figure out how I can reach certain areas. In Noki Bay, there's this one blue coin hidden in a cubby just above this walkway here. With a clever jump and a skilled hover, I was able to sneak my way in and grab it. In Pina Park, I made my way over to this cage, side-flipped as the pirate ship was coming up, landed on it, and then side-flipped and hovered over to the blue coin. Hovering feels like an extension of Mario himself, and feels just as natural as spraying goop, if not even more so. Speaking of blue coins, it's impressive how well space is utilized in this game's levels. Even when levels are small or basic by design, they still know how to use space effectively thanks to the objectives, yellow coins for obtaining the returning 100 coin shines as a mark of mastery over levels, secret blue coins which lead to more shines, and the general layout of a level inviting different ways of solving a problem. In Rico Harbor, there are multiple ways of reaching the caged shine sprite depending on where you decide to ascend from. In Pina Park, there's more than one way to climb to the top of the ferris wheel. In Noki Bay, there are many ways to reach the secret in the conch shell, from the tight ropes to the cliffside. It feels like no stone was unturned when they were planning out each level, and no level is too big for its own good. Blue coins in particular are placed in such deliberate locations so that nearly every little spot in a level feels like it holds some significance. I mentioned Gelato Beach having a relatively simplistic layout. Well, the objectives themselves are usually what offer the challenge to compensate for the level design. Some of these are rather infamous, and we'll talk about them soon enough, but they give new context to certain aspects of the level, like how searching for the sandcastle with the dune buds suddenly becomes crucial in defeating a boss, or in Rico Harbor where your ability to race through the blooper surfing course is tested further with the eight red coins on the water. Then there's Delfino Plaza itself, the central hub of this game that allows you to access all of the game's courses. One of the things I loved most about Princess Peach's castle was its secrets, and its ability to fuel the player's imagination through those secrets. Delfino Plaza is filled to the brim with things to discover, and it is a treat to run around in. You can find multiple secret shine sprites if you decide to dig into it with both your existing and unlockable abilities, blue coins all over the place if you help the islanders, explore the underground, and just investigate every street corner and every rooftop. There's a guy that'll toss you through a window in exchange for a single coin, shines hidden behind uses of the rocket and turbo nozzles. The entire plaza is essentially its own fully-fledged course, but it remains unique against the rest of them because it doesn't really have objectives for you to follow. 
Sure, occasionally something will happen that will lead you toward the next course, but all of its shines can be found through the innate curiosity of the player. And as someone who adores that aspect of Super Mario 64, Delfino Plaza is beautiful. All of these elements combined make up what I believe to be a worthy successor to Super Mario 64, and it's one with stronger theming, a gorgeous atmosphere, brilliant level design, exceptional utilization of space, and applying Mario's moves to it, and some of the best looking water I've ever seen in a video game. Seriously, it's amazing how well this water holds up, just look at it. Anyway, all of this is why I love revisiting Super Mario Sunshine. Now onto the weird stuff. Before I get into this segment of the video, I want to once again reiterate that I love this game, and some of the weird elements I'm about to highlight will be prefaced with what I think they add to its design. Honestly, I think the entirety of Super Mario Sunshine is a double-edged sword, and I find my full enjoyment with it came from me growing up with it and mastering it. Had I not played the heck out of this game as a kid, I'm not sure I would have loved this game as much as I do now. A lot of this game fights back against your enjoyment of it and it makes some questionable decisions. Let's start by talking about blue coins. 10 of these things allow you to purchase a shine sprite, and there are a whopping 240 of them in the game, resulting in 24 shine sprites obtainable exclusively through blue coins. Like I alluded to previously, I think blue coins are an excellent element that gives significant depth to exploration of each level. A lot of the time, they feel like their own puzzles and challenges, which is an incredible way to extend what each Shine Sprite strives to achieve. They are directly responsible for the levels truly flourishing, at least in my opinion, as the level's quality is otherwise contingent on the objectives they have you clear. You might even find areas you wouldn't have thought to check. Like I've mentioned, no stone left unturned in level design. There are a handful of issues, however, that lead to them being annoying when going for 100% completion. At least, sometimes. While you can check how many blue coins you have in each level, the game doesn't explicitly state how many are actually in each level, therefore meaning you'll have no idea how many you'll need to find on your first playthrough. In the main courses, there are 30 each. In Delfino Plaza, there are 20, and in Corona Mountain, there are 10. Simple enough, but you have to figure this out on your own, either by deducing it yourself after exhausting every possible spot in each level, or looking it up on the internet. And I can't really blame you if you did that. Of course, even with this knowledge, you may find yourself running around scouring the level for that last blue coin, which is a trap that many collectathon platformers were falling into at the time of this game's release. Considering Super Mario 64 inspired all of those games, and it also sidestepped that feeling by being more about the objectives than grabbing things, it's ironic to see Sunshine falling victim to genre trappings with its blue coins. On top of that, certain blue coins can be strangely obscure and cryptic. A select few blue coins can only be obtained in specific episodes of each course. In Bianco Hills, more blue coins become obtainable as you complete each episode, with every blue coin being obtainable at once in episode 8. That's fine. Rico Harbor handles its blue coins like Bianco Hills, except for three of them that are only obtainable in episode 1, and one only obtainable in episode 2. Three of them can be found along the beaten path, with this blooper surfing one being difficult to miss, but one of them requires you to do a bit of exploring, as you have to lift this boat out of the water. These are iffy, more so the boat coin than the other two. In Gelato Beach, some are obtainable in Episode 3, some are obtainable in Episode 5, some require Yoshi in Episode 6, and a handful are extra challenges during the Sandbird level in Episode 4. Also, there's a single red Cataquac that yields a blue coin in Episodes 1, 2, and 4 only. Okay, now this is getting ridiculous. But if you think that's bad, get a load of these ones. Hotel Delfino's Casino. This is not really a place you'd think would have blue coins, but it does. Three, in fact. And they are some of the stupidest examples of this episodic exclusivity. So, in episode four and five, you visit the casino. You'd think you could grab all three blue coins here in just one episode, but you can't. This M graffiti only appears behind you in episode five, not four. So if you looked behind you in episode 4 and saw nothing there, and then didn't think to look again in episode 5, that's apparently on you. This is already questionable, but then there's this blue coin right here. You can only get this one in episode 4, even though the torch is still there in episode 5, and can still be interacted with. 
Imagine spraying this torch in episode 5, not getting a blue coin, and then just ignoring it in your quest for 100% completion. I can imagine the wasted time wandering the hotel looking for that last blue coin, only to realize it was a torch you sprayed before, in the wrong episode. In contrast, Pianta Village is actually a great example of how to handle the concept of episode-exclusive blue coins. Some blue coins can only be obtained in missions that take place at night, and the same goes for missions during the day. Some require Yoshi, and you can only use him in Episode 5. A handful can only be obtained if you talk to the adult Piantas after saving them in Episode 6. And some are actually rewards for cleaning the fiery goop in Episode 3. The way these blue coins are placed all makes sense contextually with each objective. Of course, there are other examples of this, like those timed blue coins that appear in Hotel Delfino during the 8 red coin mission, or Pina Park's boxed-in blue coins that can be collected with the help of bullet bills. It's just that Pianta Village is the most consistent with this, and it's one of the reasons I love the level so much. Anyway, going back to the casino, the third blue coin here isn't exclusive to either episode, but it is an example of how unnecessarily secretive certain blue coins can be. Basically, you ground pound this specific spot on this slot machine to get a blue coin. Okay? Why this one and not the others? Then there's times where spraying random objects can get you blue coins, even though there's no indication that it would yield anything. Great, so the lamp and the ceiling light both have blue coins? Does this mean I have to run around spraying everything to see if I missed a coin in Hotel Delfino? Yes, because these bookshelves in this specific room also have a blue coin in them for some reason. Certain blue coins feel evocative of a lost sense of curiosity that I discussed in my Super Mario 64 video. Like ground pounding this Pianta statue's nose. It's an inspired concept that plays off of the player's own intuition, and it feels reminiscent of an old school Zelda game. Spraying random objects and hoping they yield blue coins, however, feels more like something you'd try when you've exhausted all other options. Perhaps the most secretive blue coin in this game is actually located in Pianta Village. At night, if you stand on the gold mushroom and spray the moon, a blue coin will appear. What? Are you kidding me? Why would the player ever think to do this? Well, believe it or not, a specific Pianta will actually hint at this one. Yeah, remember how I mentioned that Super Mario Sunshine is surprisingly text-heavy? Well, sometimes talking to everybody can be rewarding in its own right, but considering the hostility the player is met with upon arriving on the island, it's no wonder most players didn't bother speaking to this one Pianta and got stuck on this blue coin. Certain blue coins are also recycled. In every level, there are always these timed blue coins that have you running back and forth between two symbols. There are plenty of blue birds to spray, blue butterflies to eat, and villagers to hose down. This isn't a huge issue on its own, as these blue coins, especially the timed ones, are implemented differently each time. They are repetitious, but nothing worth complaining about for too long. They do, however, accompany a much larger problem with Super Mario Sunshine altogether. It repeats content to fill its objectives. You fight this goopy fellow five times. You fight Petey Piranha twice, with the second time having you wait for him to stop flying around, and then wait for him to stop using his tornado attack so that you can defeat him in the exact same way. You fight Gooper Blooper three times, and the fight is largely the same each time. You'll have to race Il Piantissimo to a certain point in a level three times, and it's not ever a serious challenge. You'll have to run after Shadow Mario and hose him down in order to take a Shine Sprite from him seven times. Each chase taking place in a different level, mind you, but these aren't exactly what I'd call difficult. Perhaps the most egregious example of recycled content comes in the form of Red Coin missions. I think Red Coin missions are great in moderation but there are a total of 24 red coin missions in Super Mario Sunshine, and they are all packed into 7 levels in the hub world, rather than being spread out across 16 levels in the castle's secret areas like Super Mario 64. On average, each level can have between 2 to 4 red coin missions in them. Like, jeez, you think that one would be enough, right? The Fluff Festival coin hunt was a great test of your knowledge of the level, as is the red coin hunt in Hotel Delfino. There's also the secret one you can find in Delfino Plaza by rocketing up to a pipe. You'll have to search through a tall patch of grass to find things to interact with, hidden areas, and a red bird in order to collect them all. There are genuinely great red coin missions in this game. It's just the abundance of them that makes them feel tiresome after a while. 
A decent portion of the red coin missions take place within the secret areas within levels. I mean, they're not exactly secret areas if the camera zooms in on where they are, giving you a clear idea of where you're supposed to go, but at the very least, figuring out how to get into them can be pretty fun. And once you do, you'll have to clear a platforming challenge without flood on your back. I've mentioned these already, but they are genuinely engaging tests of your acclimation to Mario's core movement. That said, if you re-enter each of them, you can take on a timed red coin mission with Flood equipped. These can be fun as well, but re-entering every single secret area just to do another red coin mission in a level I just cleared usually leaves me fatigued by the end of the game. I think another reason I'm a bit salty about their inclusion is the fact that the red coin missions in those secret levels count as a secret shine. In all seven courses, there are two shines that are not hinted at through the episode menu. You have to figure out how to find these shines on your own, much like the various shine sprites hidden around Delfino Plaza. My favorites include the yellow bird hidden atop a cliff in Noki Bay, climbing atop the tallest palm tree in Pianta Village and spraying the sun to reveal a shine, and that one dune bud in Gelato Beach that creates a staircase into the ground, with a wall that is begging to be sprayed. Unfortunately, this idea is severely underutilized. Nearly all of the secret shines within levels are red coin missions within those so-called secret areas. This always felt like such a weird decision to me. Coupled with the blue coins, this game's secret shines had the potential to be so freeform and rewarding. It's why I think Delfino Plaza is one of the greatest hub worlds to ever grace a 3D platformer. If they had applied the design and structure of Delfino Plaza to the rest of the game, it would have been an incredible way to expand upon the design of Super Mario 64. As it stands, I don't think the red coin missions in the secret areas are terrible, but they're uninspired and repetitive inclusions. And then there's the Chuckster secret area. Oh man, I think it's finally time I talk about these types of missions. Super Mario Sunshine contains several missions that are strange in the face of the rest of its design. Some shines are just completely removed from what you're doing throughout the game, while others contribute to strange difficulty spikes. I can make a case for blooper surfing as it tests the timing of your jumps while also keeping you on the move. It's a cool subversion of the typical platforming, and I believe the challenge works. There's also the underwater shines in Noki Bay, which are awkward and sluggish to control, but they are more relaxed levels and allow the player to explore at their own pace, with some of the most beautiful music ever featured in a Mario game. Cleaning Elimouth's teeth is a pain though. And I don't blame you if you fostered a hatred for the way Mario controls underwater because of this mission. The Sandbird is an infamous shine because you have to collect seven red coins as it flies around and does wacky flight maneuvers. There's an added challenge if you decide to go for the blue coins floating on nearby clouds, although thankfully you keep them once they've been collected, so you can die as much as you like. I think what people struggle with most is how awkwardly the ground beneath Mario can behave as the bird flies around. It's entirely possible to just slip off the bird as it rotates, and jumping around on its back is spooky. I personally enjoy the challenge of this level, but it's very strange for a level this difficult to exist halfway through the third level you can access. Then there's shines that are just... bizarre. At the beginning of Peanut Park, you'll have to fight Mecha Bowser while riding a roller coaster. While there is thankfully a lot of Mecha Bowser to hit, at high speeds, it's difficult to fire rockets accurately. This is especially apparent in Episode 8. Although the balloons can be positioned in ways that ask you to time and aim your shots just right, this just doesn't feel like it has any right being in the game. Speaking of aiming at things, the secret of the Casino Shrine is comically annoying. In order to even unlock the puzzle leading to the secret area, you have to play slots. While one is just a matter of lining up all three sevens manually, the other is completely random. Cool, I guess eventually I'll be able to play the rest of the game. After finally getting lucky at slots, you'll have to flip each of these tiles over in order to create an image of a shine sprite. You flip them all by spraying water on them, which is extremely finicky because you are using water to flip tiles, and they have this nasty habit of spinning rapidly while wet. You try to spray one tile and you'll flip the adjacent ones. You can use the outside of the frame to cheese the tiles on the edge into flipping the way you want, but man, this shine is infamous for a reason. And if you're going for 100%, you have to repeat this entire process just to collect red coins in the secret area. Wonderful! Thank you, Sunshine! Speaking of infamous shines, the Watermelon Festival. You have to find the biggest watermelon, which is at the top of the hill, and then carefully roll the watermelon over to the juicer. 
The watermelon can explode from touching pretty much anything. If a catequack touches it, it's gone. If you squeeze it in between yourself and a tree, it's gone. If it touches the water, it's gone. Basically, you have to slowly inch your way through the trees and across the beach, spraying and jumping on any catequack that comes near it. Then, you have to carefully and anxiously roll it along this bridge in order to throw it in the juicer and grab the shine. This one is ridiculous, but we're not done yet. Anyone want to play some pachinko? This secret shine in Delfino Plaza is all about the direction in which you tilt the control stick. Your hover nozzle is almost useless due to how momentum works after being launched. It's all about going either left or right. It's not that difficult when you know what you're doing. At least, for me it isn't. The problem? The game completely changes the way Mario controls just for this shine, which is jarring and an exercise in frustration for many. You also have to recollect every single red coin if you die, as well as wait for Mario to slide back down after either grabbing a coin or missing altogether. But for me, nothing truly compares to how bafflingly stupid this secret area is in Pianta Village. The Chuckster secret area. In this level, the only way to cross between platforms is to be thrown by a Pianta. You line yourself up with them, and then cross your fingers that you get thrown at the right angle. You can find an optimal angle for each of them, but it's mostly prayer. I cannot fathom why they decided to include this as a level. It almost feels intentionally brutal, playing off of how unwelcome the Piantas make Mario feel at every turn. Now, when it comes to Delfino Plaza, there's one shine that I have to mention. Do you remember that lonely islander I mentioned earlier in the video? Well, right next to him is a pipe that can't be opened with water alone. You need Yoshi to dissolve this yellow goop. However, Yoshi is allergic to water, and touching it will immediately kill him. So, how do you get over there with Yoshi? By riding on boats and quickly transferring to others as they pass by. You also need to make sure that you are eating fruit on the nearby island, as well as the banana on this lone platform so that Yoshi doesn't starve. It is an excruciatingly long trip and also terrifying, as the threat of having to start from the very beginning is always present. When you finally arrive, you'll find yourself in what is unquestionably one of the most difficult levels in the game. There are a few elements at play here. The water is poisonous and will kill Mario instantly if he touches it, the lily pad is constantly moving due to the current of the river, and you have to collect 8 red coins while maneuvering through the river. If you miss a red coin or two, you have two options. Your first option is to carefully inch along the sides of the river, and then hover over the water to grab it. Your second option is to embrace death. You might be thinking about taking that pipe at the end, but no, that pipe is not an option. If you go in that pipe, you'll spawn right back in Delfino Plaza, and you'll have to start over. Most people will learn this the hard way. It's a cruel prank. The last instance of weird inclusions I wanted to mention were Corona Mountain's 10 blue coins. They're the blue coins I always leave for last, and for good reason. I didn't talk much about this, but you can actually steer a boat around in Noki Bay as you would a lily pad to collect blue coins, except the way the boat turns is relative to which way it is facing, and which way you spray water from. It's much more difficult to control, and if the boat touches anything, it's gone. In Corona Mountain, the boat doesn't respawn if you crash into something, meaning the same options for the polluted river shine apply here. It is an agonizing journey full of precise turning and very tight squeezes in order to grab those last blue coins. But it is ironically far more fulfilling to do this than to just clear Corona Mountain and beat the game normally. As a final level, Corona Mountain is pitifully easy and perplexingly short. You just time your jumps with the spikes, hover over the fire to put it out, and then ride your boat over to the end, where you rock it up to the final boss. The final boss also doesn't put up much of a fight as long as you know how to time your rocket jumps. In spite of everything, I always collected every shine sprite in Super Mario Sunshine. I always grab every blue coin, and deposit them all at once to watch my shine counter shoot up. I believe the game is simultaneously less and more enjoyable if you choose to go for 100%. This game is an anomaly. Now you might be thinking, if this game is anything like Super Mario 64, you should be able to just skip the shines you don't like in order to finish the game, right? You should have a choice in which shines you collect, right? This brings me to my last point. This is perhaps the weirdest decision Super Mario Sunshine made. In order to finish this game, you must complete Episode 7 in every world. 
you no longer have any freedom to choose which shines you collect in order to finish the game. This also means you only have to collect a minimum of 50 shine sprites to beat the game, 20 less than Super Mario 64. Let's break this down. Of the 24 red coin missions, you are required to finish just 8 of them. That might seem nice, but that still accounts for almost a fifth of the missions required to finish the game. You are required to complete two blooper surfing missions. You have to fight the sludge boss every single time it appears. You have to fight Petey Piranha twice. You have to fight Gooper Blooper three times. You have to complete ten secret areas, including the Chuckster one. You have to finish the Sandbird mission. You have to hover underwater in Noki Bay twice. And lastly, you have to chase down Shadow Mario seven times. This means of the 50 shines required to finish the game, eight are red coin missions, and just over 20 of them are repeats of previous content. Sometimes these shines are utilized in unique settings, but that still doesn't change the fact that three-fifths of this game's required shines don't feel entirely distinct, and some carry their own problems with them. Conversely, this structure also means you do not have to complete the second red coin mission in Bianco Hills. You do not have to complete the Watermelon Festival Shine. You do not have to shoot the balloons on the roller coaster. You do not have to collect red coins in the hotel. You do not have to complete the third underwater mission in Noki Bay, which is also a red coin mission. You do not have to complete the Fluff Festival Coin Hunt. You do not ever have to collect 100 coins in a level. You do not ever have to revisit secret areas and collect red coins with Flood. And finally, the two biggest things, you do not have to collect a single blue coin, and you do not have to collect a single shine in Delfino Plaza, nor do you really have to interact with it at all, rendering the pachinko level, the red coins in the grass, the infamous river shine, and all other secret shines in this beautiful hub world completely optional. I also want to point out that these requirements for beating the game are not made clear to you until after Corona Mountain is made accessible, which occurs once you finish the seventh episode of Every World. On your first playthrough, you could be throwing yourself at some tough levels, only to realize that there was no point in finishing them if all you wanted to do was defeat Bowser and save the day. Now you can form your own opinions of each of these elements, but I just want to hammer in how painful it is for me that certain elements are not required while others are. By rendering blue coins and 100 coin shines useless in terms of primary progression, you are both alleviating issues players might have with locating the coins, while also removing a layer of depth to each level that made them significantly more compelling than they already were. By making Episode 8 useless, you both eliminate certain obnoxious shines, while also eliminating ones that people might think are pretty cool. By making secret shines optional, you remove the repetition in collecting 8 red coins in the secret areas, but you also remove some of the cool ones that you can discover on your own. And finally, by making the entirety of Delfino Plaza completely pointless to finishing the game, you take all of the wonder, discovery, detail, and fun out of one of the greatest hub worlds ever constructed for a 3D platformer. On the other hand, going for all 120 shines reintroduces all of the positive and negative connotations of each mechanic, each level, and each collectible. There is a third option of collecting as many shines and blue coins as you like and feeling satisfied with what you've done, rather than going for completionism, and that might be the most comfortable way of playing the game, but you still have to go through all of the required shines anyway. I feel like the game's structural problems would have been solved had they set it up more like Super Mario 64. Require players to grab 70 shine sprites to reach Corona Mountain, and allow them to grab whichever shines they want. Sure, you'd have to make certain shines mandatory, as completing certain shines in Pina Park makes the other nozzles and Yoshi appear in Delfino Plaza, but you could at least point players toward those shines if need be. Giving the player freedom to complete this game however they like would allow them to collect as many blue coins as they want, obtain secret shines at their leisure in Delfino Plaza, and even collect 100 coins in the levels they like the most. It's weird. All of these things are just so damn weird. In the end, it's up to you. Do you scoff at the sight of those ridiculous levels and just play the required ones? Or do you go for every single shine in the game, despite the problems you may face? Well, personally, I've always collected them all. I don't know what it is, but I find myself drawn to the sadistic nature of this game. 
I mean, I'm able to complete some of the hardest tasks in this game while only dying once or twice. I've mastered the Pachinko minigame, the Sandbird level, the infamous River Shine, and all of the other brutal levels. I know exactly how to align myself with the Pianta so that I get thrown the same way every single time. I've memorized a lot of the blue coins across each level, so completing them all makes me feel like I'm in a wonderland of brilliant platforming and exploration every time I play through this game. Even when I'm faced with some of the most barbaric shines that leave me bruised and battered, I just kind of laugh about them, even when I die over and over again. I've always felt that the unrelenting difficulty spikes and unkind atmosphere present in a lot of Super Mario Sunshine felt deliberate. I've come to interpret the uncharacteristically challenging shines and jerkish piantas and nokis as an elaborate joke the developers have conveyed. I think that's why I find the most ridiculous things about this game so amusing and endearing. Like, why is this game designed the way it is? Why is there a shine designed around talking to people and getting thrown from specific positions? Why is the pachinko shine a thing? Why is there a shine that has you transfer from one boat to another, and then somehow steer a fast-moving lily pad over certain death? What is wrong with this game? I don't know, but it's hilarious. I love watching people attempt these levels for the first time. I love seeing people get frustrated with the game's problems, as well as hear them criticize the unpleasant residents of Isle Delfino and their corrupt legal system. I mean, I have no idea if the developers intended for this to be the case, but the amusement I get out of how ruthless and unforgiving this game can be, coupled with how relaxing and incredible I feel it can be, all come together to make it one of the most special video games I have ever played. Its dichotomy is unlike anything I've ever experienced and I think that's why I continue to revisit it, every year. Of course, this game's structure is something I can never defend. It feels trapped between mirroring its predecessor, and wanting to be something more linear like Super Mario Galaxy. Super Mario Sunshine is an exceptionally weird game, but it's one that I will continue to both punish myself and relax with for a long time, because it brings me joy, even in the weirdest of ways. And you know what? I think I know why the game turned out the way it did. Super Mario Sunshine was first revealed at Space World 2001. The trailer featured Mario running around in an early version of Delfino Plaza, with a release window of Summer 2002 being revealed. The game was released as scheduled just 11 months after the presentation, and according to Miyamoto, if you take away the time it took for Nintendo EAD to develop the engine that powered Sunshine, Wind Waker, and other GameCube and Wii games, Super Mario Sunshine was developed in just 18 months. That early version of Delfino Plaza, perhaps the adjacent areas like Rico Harbor, as well as the scraps of a mission structure that didn't make it into the final game, were all that was in place at the time. Due to the dire circumstances of the GameCube in comparison to its competitors, Super Mario Sunshine was rushed, as was The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. The Wind Waker lost two of its dungeons to time constraints, being replaced with the controversial Triforce chart quest, as well as other areas and features. In Super Mario Sunshine's case, this meant the game had to undergo substantial reworks, and the lack of proper development time led to some fascinating and often humorous oversights being left in the final game. In an interview for Retro Gamer magazine, co-director Yoshiaki Koizumi stated that they originally explored the idea of a disaster recovery mission style game. In an early prototype, the player wasn't searching for shine sprites, and instead the story was set on an island that was slowly being polluted by enemies. The idea was that you'd wash the pollution away with flood, and also use it to defeat the boss enemy, the source of the pollution. We experimented with a lot of different things before we switched over to making it a platform action game. Left over in the files of the Japanese version of the game, there are unused lines of text that reference missions Mario could take on, including Mario finding a tourist's missing daughter, borrowing the turbo nozzle from a student of a nearby school, as well as the central mission that the entire game would have revolved around, raising Delfino Plaza's tourism rating to 5 stars as you help them recover from disaster. Based on how the dialogue trees are structured, all of this text seems to be from that early version of Sunshine that was mission-based and it references a scrapped form of currency, as well as a train system that spanned Isle Delfino. This train system would have been the primary method of accessing levels and progressing through the game, 
You'd spend your soul coins to purchase travel stamps to each island, which can be earned both from collecting them across each level, as well as completing missions across Isle Delfino. This all lines up with what Koizumi discussed, meaning that sometime between Space World 2001 in August and E3 2002 in May, the game's structure was entirely revamped to align with Super Mario 64. The station list also references several levels that were cut from the final game, meaning the developers did not have enough time to implement them. The names of most of these levels actually show up in the game's debug level select, but selecting them just resets the game, as their data doesn't exist on the disc anymore. All of this means that in the span of 9 months, the team had to map out several shine sprites across the game, potentially reworking certain missions into shine sprites which would contextualize the running narratives in Serana Beach and Noki Bay, as well as decide which levels could stay and which had to go, so that they could finish the game on time. Certain levels also had to be completely redesigned in this time. The knowledge of this game's actual development time being compressed into less than a year contextualizes a lot of the game's decisions. Only 7 main levels compared to Super Mario 64's 16? That makes sense. Repeating content to fill objectives? That checks out. Objectives that are disconnected from the core platforming or throw you something completely out of left field? Yeah, you could argue the development cycle had to do with those shines making it in. Only 3 additional nozzles in the final game with one of them being completely situational? That makes a lot of sense too. The hover nozzle is awesome and the rocket nozzle is phenomenal for scaling large vertical level elements, but I really only ever use the turbo nozzle if a shine or blue coin requires me to. On solid ground you can spray ahead of yourself and then dive into the puddle to do an infinite high speed belly slide, which can swiftly transport Mario from one place to the next without using water. I only use the turbo nozzle when I have to traverse a body of water quickly or smash a barricade. In an interview, co-director Kenta Usui stated that there were about 10 candidates for nozzles at one point, and the hover nozzle was not one of the top picks. The developers weren't even sure if they should include it, but ultimately they chose it due to the freedom and generosity it offered the player. So if you think the hover nozzle makes the game too easy and breaks platforming, you're not alone. The developers felt the same way at one point. The game's rush development also sheds light on why blue coins are even in the game to begin with. Since 24 of the game's 120 shine sprites are obtained through blue coins, and there were multiple scrapped levels, you could easily allocate those shine sprites to the other levels had they been implemented. Then again, blue coins contribute a lot to the final game's design as I've discussed, so I'm not sure what I would have done in that situation. In the end, Super Mario Sunshine was unquestionably and unceremoniously rushed, which is uncharacteristic of Nintendo today. After they survived the GameCube era, they mostly gave their developers more time and resources to see their creative visions through. There were some exceptions to this of course, but this practice of rushing games to turn a profit has thankfully faded away. It's a shame though that one of my favorite Mario games, as well as my favorite video game of all time, both had to suffer as a result of Nintendo's circumstances. At the very least, it did result in some fun oversights and unused features. All of the oversights you're about to see can be observed in an unmodified copy of the game, regardless of how you decide to play. You can also learn more about them, as well as research other oddities pertaining to Super Mario Sunshine on the cutting room floor at tcrf.net. The pre-rendered cutscenes appear to have been created at different points in development, but each level contains miscellaneous differences from the levels you actually explore. Stuff like graffiti in places that normally don't have graffiti, as well as misplaced objects. In the cutscene where Shadow Mario summons Mecha Bowser, you can see Mario snoring by the merry-go-round. This is hilarious to me because in Source Filmmaker, you usually need to do that in order to capture certain scenes. Did they stuff Mario nearby to record these animations or something? Also, in the final scene where Bowser is chatting with his son, who happens to be Shadow Mario by the way, I kinda glossed over that, you can see through Bowser's eye. I guess they figured that because Bowser was sitting against the backdrop of a cloud, you wouldn't be able to tell. But I can definitely see the sky through his transparent eyeball when he moves his head in certain ways. Speaking of different versions of levels, there are some weird things that occur in specific states of Delfino Plaza. When Peach is kidnapped and you are led toward Pina Park, all of the toads will be running around, panicking. One of these toads happens to run around underneath the level because his pathing was misplaced. You'd never know he was there, and yet he has unique dialogue pointing you toward the princess. This poor yellow toad is trapped underneath the level. When Delfino Plaza is flooded, 
a handful of strange things can happen. First off, this manhole appears in the jail cell, and the entrance to the cell is blocked off. You can't interact with the manhole, but it appears to be from an earlier design of the plaza wherein you'd have to obtain the blue coin by traversing the underground. In the final game, you just kind of hover into the cell. I have no idea why they decided to change this, but it's amusing to me that this manhole reappears when the plaza is flooded. The plaza also has several mangled or incorrectly mapped textures during the flood. They appear stretched and distorted in the final game when closely examined. Then there's one texture where the opposite occurs. The corner of this radio tower is messed up in every state of Delfino Plaza, except for when the plaza is flooded, in which it is completely normal. What? In Bianco Hills, the sun is bright and beautiful as it shines down on you. Except for Episode 6, in which they just forgot to add the sun. There is no sun in Episode 6. In Rico Harbor, if you initiate the Gooper Blooper boss fight in Episode 1, and then run back to where you spawned, you can stand on an invisible barrel. I discovered this one when I was a kid, actually. I got scared of Gooper Blooper and ran back here, and then as I was jumping around, I landed on it. The barrel doesn't have any collision on its sides, only on top, which is why you wouldn't even know this thing was here. Why is it here, and only here in this state of Rico Harbor? It's a secret to everybody. In nearly every level of Super Mario Sunshine, you can observe Pina Park's iconic Ferris wheel from afar. It'll spin no matter where you observe it from. Except for Delfino Plaza, in which it is part of the level geometry, therefore it cannot spin. On the beach during Pina Park Episode 3, the Ferris wheel can be seen spinning quickly. Even though it's supposed to be doing that in Episode 5. In Episode 5, the Ferris wheel is spinning normally, and only starts spinning quickly after you enter the park. I'm guessing these two episodes switched places during development, but they never noticed this inconsistency. In Serena Beach, Episode 4, you can climb on this lamppost in the casino. In Episode 5, you cannot. Okay then. In Noki Bay's Red Coins in a Bottle mission, you can spot a strange door with a book behind it. These two models are part of the level's geometry, but it's bizarre that they even exist in the first place. Most have theorized that the original objective here would be to retrieve the book, but for some reason the book remained in the final game. I'm not even sure if this counts as an oversight, but I figure I'd mention it because this pointless book drove my imagination wild as a kid. And finally, one of my favorite oversights, when you're riding the roller coaster, nearly all of the palm trees in the level are misplaced or otherwise non-existent. Some are clipping through the awning near the beginning of the level. One is chilling on the rim of the pool. One of them is jutting out of the pianta-shaped tree where a blue coin is normally located. And one of them is just floating above the water. And yet, because the shadows underneath the palm trees are part of the map's textures, the shadows remain, even though the trees aren't there. Once again, a massive shout-out to the Cutting Room Floor for their documentation of these oddities. My guess is that Nintendo prioritized testing that focused on primary game features, and ignored a lot of the feedback that wouldn't affect most players, like a lot of the oversights I just mentioned. This is very much unlike Nintendo. Normally I associate their games with a level of polish and detail very few developers have the resources to match, but some contemporaneous reviews of the game took notice of the game's lack of polish. Not through these blunders I've listed, but more so the problematic aspects of its design like its objectives, difficulty spikes, rehashed content, and missed potential. Clearly no amount of testing would alleviate the fundamental issues this game faced during development, and sacrifices had to be made. And yet, I know several people who cite Super Mario Sunshine as one of their favorite video games, including myself. I think Super Mario Sunshine's legacy, although complicated, speaks to the quality of Nintendo's games in general. Despite everything it had going against it, many people still love this game. Personally, I feel Super Mario Sunshine had the elements necessary to be what Super Mario Odyssey eventually became. Exploring for blue coins mirrors the wonder evoked by Power Moons in that game, and the notion of certain objectives ringing in new phases of the level was something that Odyssey eventually adopted. Super Mario Sunshine wouldn't be re-released on every platform like its predecessor was. Even the 3D Zelda games on GameCube received proper standalone remasters on Wii U, but this game never did. Instead, an emulated version of the game was made available for six months on Super Mario 3D All-Stars before the collection was delisted. 
I guess I could understand why Nintendo would be embarrassed of this game in hindsight, but I for one feel the game should be made available to everyone, so that they can form their own opinion of it. I think a general distaste for this game, as well as a burning passion for it, are both more than valid perspectives to have, and I want people to discover this game for themselves if they missed out on it. Super Mario Sunshine is indeed a very weird game, with its unpredictable jumps in difficulty and unrelenting atmosphere of hostility from its islanders being played up like a joke. The decision to use fully voiced cutscenes with questionable acting, its rushed development leading to many uncharacteristic oversights, as well as entirely scrapped ideas and structures, and its setup of collecting seven shines in every world having severe flaws that completely discard cool aspects of the game. With that said, it also remains an important entry in the series for its unmistakably inventive central mechanic, the freedom at play when exploring for blue coins, the incredible levels and objectives it features, the extraordinary atmosphere and attention to detail in its setting, and one that is personal to me, a fascination with the strange, unusual, and hilariously aggravating things it features. Super Mario Sunshine may not consistently be an amazing game, but I adore what it does right, and I am enamored with its wonderfully weird decisions. For many reasons, both compelling and contentious, it remains unique against the rest of the franchise, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I love this game, and I'll keep coming back to it for years and years. I've been Liam Triforce. Thanks for watching.